Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the meeting. Different face in the chair today. Um, our chair is joining us remotely today. Um, members, just so that everyone is clear, I want to advise you that our five members are due to attend the meeting in person and three members attending via Starleaf. I will chair the meeting um, as the chairperson is attending remotely via Starleaf. The following members are present in person. Sinead Ennis, Andy Allen, Robin Newton, is due to join us shortly, sorry, and Fran McCann. Um, the following members are attending via Starleaf, Paula Bradley and Jonathan Buckley, and we're just waiting on Mark Durkin to join us on Starleaf. Um, we're expecting Robin will be calling in with us shortly, and hopefully Mark will be able to join us. Um, I'd also like to remind members of the requirement to declare any interest that they may have in relation to items under discussion today. And just to double check, uh, we don't have any apologies so far because we are waiting on Robin um, and Mark joining us. Um, I don't think there's anything else there. I think all our speakers are due to attend. Um, I'm going to move on to agenda item number two, which is chairperson's business. Um, Paula, I'm going to bring you in at this point. Do you want to take your chairperson's business? Well, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just want to inform members that I uh, appeared on the Sunday Politics Show on Sunday morning and also um, Good Evening Extra uh, yesterday evening as well to talk about the funding for the arts. And I know it was very welcome to say that the Finance Minister announced it yesterday um, in the Chamber that he was now ready to allocate um, the, mon the money for the arts sector. So I was just ready to I ask, ask um, the members... Um, about having the arts sector, or the arts council, in again um, to brief us in committee. Um, we don't know the finer details around the funding and how it's going to be distributed and, and to whom it's going to be distributed. So I think it would be a good idea to get them in. I know the minister's in with us next week, so she'll be able to answer um, a lot of those questions um, around the finance and what way the finance is going to be rolled out. Um, so just want to uh, inform members of that. I also want to inform members also that I attended the Chairperson's Liaison Group yesterday. So um, we will be going back to our normal committee day. Um, that will hopefully be, be by uh, the beginning of October. Um, that will be in place. But um, as always, members will be informed as to when the, when the, the committee is going to take place. And also it was uh, pointed out at the CLG yesterday that the committee can now, uh, committees can now go on outside visits. Um, I, I know before we go on those visits, there has to be sort of health and safety checks done. So I kind of was thinking about it and I thought it might be a good idea because it would be an idea of getting us all together um, in the one room in a venue that was big enough to hold us and we could certainly hold a committee visit. So it was just to throw that out there and um, for a uh, conversation around it. I mean, I would maybe suggest the likes of um, the... the, the Museum, the Austrian Museum, uh, might be an idea for us to go and visit, but just to, to throw that out to the meeting. So that's all I have on, on that for the moment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so just, just to, before we go into that discussion, can I just check with all the members, are you content then that we invite the Arts Council to come along to brief the committee for a future date when they can be fitted in um, and to get an update on the expenditure? The new, hopefully the money will be announced shortly. Yes, thank you. And then, um, as as our chair has said, um, uh, do we agree to inv maybe even the team, Paula, to investigate the possibility of an external meeting? Um, I know that there's the risk assessments need to be completed, but have members any ideas of other places that, other than the Austrian Museum, that you might consider a possibility? Um, we want to tie it in True. with um, the the. Um, committee purposes. Jonathan, sorry, you've indicated. Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. And it's, it's just probably on that point uh, with the committee's purposes. I, I see in correspondence, which will come on to later, there is a, a visit that has been requested of the committee to visit a bureau uh, to discuss the, uh, you know, around from the liquor licensing perspective. I think that would be a good opportunity for the committee to get together if possible. Fran McCann has just said that he um, would vote for that one. Um, anybody else have any considerations? Uh, Sinead. Sure, I think we had mentioned at a previous meeting about um, doing our, in terms of sport, we're going to try and get out to uh, Ravenhill um, 
Windsor Park and to GA venue. So if we could revisit that, maybe. So that's um, we have on the table at the moment. It's later in our paper um, a proposal for a visit to a brewery. We have the Ulster Museum and we have a sports facility. I think that would be enough for our team to go away and investigate the possibility of an external meeting at a, a suitable venue. Obviously, we have to bear in mind COVID restrictions um, to ensure that um, that that we're all safe, including the people that we'll be visiting. So the team will need to take advice from CAMS and the clerk assistants on that. Um, so there's a few ideas there. If anyone has any other ideas of places, um, please do forward them on to the clerk. Um, moving now on to um, page six of our meeting pack, which is the draft minutes. This is the minutes for our last meeting held on the 9th of September. Are members content with the minutes of the 9th of September as drafted, or have anybody any amendments? If you're content with those, can you <coughs> say aye? Yep. Huh? Yep, thank you. Um, then agenda item four, page 14. Members have been provided at page 14 with the draft note of the committee's strategic planning day. Members have a number of decisions to make on its contents. So if I can take you to point two, um, it's planned that members of the Assembly's Research Service will be with us for a short and formal session next week to discuss a series of research proposals with the committee based on the planning day. Are you happy to note that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Point three, I need to ask you if you wish to pursue any further work on community sport as outlined at point three. And anybody, any comments on that? So are you content to pursue further work mm -hmm. on that? Yes. So it's, as it says there at the last line, do members want to forward the sport at NI paper to the department to encourage more funding for community sport? We're content to do that, yeah. Yep. And then we'll see what the response is coming back from that and we can see how we can carry on. There may well be an announcement on Thursday um, about sport too. And then um, point four to ask you if you agree on the way forward proposed in point four regarding dealing with the request to brief the committee. So this is where we had discussed not necessarily having, um, po it's not possible at the moment to do face-to-face -face briefing, so we were talking about holding something after committees where we can meet groups together. Are we content with, with trialling out that? Yeah. And then point five, can I ask if you have any further issues to add to the list at point five of the note? This is the list of issues that members have said that they wish the minister to cover in her forthcoming briefing sessions. Um, so if you could look at that, if there's anything else that you want to add to it or anything that has been left off, we would like to get this note to the minister as soon as possible because she is due to come to see us. She's not going to cover all of these next week. It will be over a series of meetings. Um, but Shinny, it's already indicated. Yeah, I would obviously like to add casement to that, but I understand that that will be pending the decision. So we're, ho we're hopeful that the decision will be forthcoming within the next few weeks. Okay. So it may be, you know, we may want to put it there just in anticipation of that coming, because yep. obviously this uh, department will have a responsibility in terms of the business case. So we'll add that onto the list then for the Minister to bring forward. As I say, she won't cover everything next week. It may well be over a number of sessions. Um, but if anybody has anything else, could I actually propose today that you get anything else you can think of to the team as quickly as possible today so that that information can go to the Minister because we want to play fair and make sure that she's advised of what we want to talk about well in advance. Um, then we now move on page 16, if I can take you there. Um, we've been provided with, uh, sorry, is that everybody okay with that strategic planning? Yeah? Yep. Thank you. M uh, page 16. Um, sure, sorry. Sorry, jo Jonathan, go on ahead. Sorry, Chair. I caught, I caught it late, but uh, Sinead's suggestion in relation to casement, I, I think we would need to take advice from the committee whether it would be premature to do so, given that it is a planning decision and how that may look, uh, given that the decision is still not been made. I think Sinead was suggesting that we wait until we hear the outcome. Well, I think we should have it on the list, because if we're talking about a forward work programme, then that very much would be included in a forward work programme. Made it make sense? It's it's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. So it will not interfere with that planning process, but it'll be on the list for later in the year uh, after that planning decision. Mark, thank you very much for joining us. Um, no problem. Um, we're just going through the points now. We're moving to page 16 of our pack. 
We've been provided with a departmental letter in relation to amendments to the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill Legislative Consent Motion. Um, Jerry McCann and Anne McCleary are here today to quickly update members as to the changes since the committee last considered the original LCM. So I'm going to take the opportunity now, if everybody's ready, that we invite Jerry and Anne to brief the committee. Do we have Jerry and Anne? I'm not sure who that is that's just joined us. Patricia Quinn. Sorry. Yes, can you hear me? Um, I'm actually here with Marie Kavanagh, who's part of the PIP review. Oh, Marie, uh, we'll, we'll, Patricia, we'll come to you um, after the briefing. We have another briefing to take first on an LCM, um, so we will come to you very shortly. Patricia? No problem. No problem. Um, do you want me to move on to the next item then? Okay, no problem. Um, we just don't have Jerry and Anne joining us by the power of technology. Um, we will get them very shortly. Um, we will come back to the LCM. So what I will do at this stage is move on then to page 24 members. There's a departmental letter in relation to the transfer of welfare reform powers from Westminster back to the Assembly. The Welfare Reform Northern Ireland Order 2015 Cessation of Transitionary Provision Order 2020 was laid in Parliament by the Department for Work and Pensions at Westminster on the 2nd of September 2020 and that takes effect from um, the 23rd of September um, this year. Just to ask members, have you any comments or are you content to note that change? Note. Content to note. Content to note. I'm not seeing any indications. Sorry. Of that. Sorry, who's that? Mark. Sorry, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. No, well, I suppose just to welcome uh, the return of this power that I don't think should ever have handed over in the first place. And since Westminster have had it, they've used it. Uh, they've used it to inflict uh, harm and hurt on, on many families and individuals here. But I was just wondering, and it might be one for the Minister when she comes in next week, now that we have it back, what are we going to do with it? You know, does she have any plans to, to, to use that power to, to put measures in place? And I, I know we'll be discussing the mitigations as well, uh, but to, to minimise the harm and hurt uh, being caused to people here uh, by, the, by some of the policies that were introduced, such as the two-child rule uh, and the, the dreadful rape clause that comes along with that. I think that's. Uh, uh, I think if everybody has agreed, yes. I think that is a, an important thing. As you say, Mark, we're going to be talking about the mitigations. It's very clear that Northern Ireland does need mitigations put in place, so that would be worthwhile to add to our list for the Minister, just to say that would be something that we would like her to um, update us on. Um, sure. Yes, Brad. Well, I appreciate uh, what, what, what Mark said, but we also need to take on, on, uh, on board that the Minister... Uh, when when the, the pre one of the previous assemblies was one of the biggest supporters of medications, and had she not have been along with our party, there wouldn't have been any medications at that time. Other parties opted out uh, of those medications. I think that it, it, I think that <coughs> we have to recognise that here is different to the rest of the UK, and, and those medications, as we have voted for all in, in the new decade, new approach, are certainly something there to protect people. Um, so we'll add that to the list for the Minister. She can update us with her plans are now that she'll have those powers back and they'll come into play next week. It's not 23rd of September. It's amazing how quickly this month's going. Uh, members, you've also been provided at page 26 with the deep 26, sorry, with the departmental letter in relation to the concordat between the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and the co voluntary and community mm -hmm. sector. Um, just to ask you, have you any comments on this? Or are you content to note? Content to note? Note. Yeah. Um, we know that the concordat agreement between the community and voluntary sector and, and government is currently being looked at, but this is slightly different. This is the housing executive one, um, so we're content to note that one. No word from our other guests coming along? I just want to move on to the independent review if, if they're there. Not at the minute. I think, do we have um, Ms Kavanagh? And I know we have Patricia there at the moment. We may be able to move on to them first. Yes, I'm here, Marie. 
Hello, oh, Marie. <coughs> Hello, Marie. Um, I'll just introduce you first of all. Um, thank you very much for being available for us at this time. I will declare an interest because I did meet Marie um, as part of the Alliance Party delegation to discuss the briefing on the second independent review of PIP, but Marie's here today to update the committee. Um, so, sure, I'll also declare an interest as I met uh, separately as well as the Unionist Party representative. Thank you, Andy. Um, so, members, um, Marie Cavanagh is here today to update us on the progress of the second independent review of how the personal independence payment PIP assessment is working in Northern Ireland. Marie has over 30 years experience in the voluntary and community sector, working with women and families on social welfare and rights-based issues in areas of socio-economic disadvantage. She is formerly chair of NICFA and is currently chair of Children in Northern Ireland. The public consultation is underway and closes on the 16th of October. Anybody watching this, get your input in, please. The call for evidence will be one of several methods used to gather information during the review. Um, I'd like to welcome you both, uh, Marie and Patricia, to the meeting. Um, <coughs> Marie, would you like to... How long do you want today, Marie? I, I can see you have a fairly packed agenda, so I have 15, 20 minutes maximum, I think, from my right. point of view. Thank you very um, much. We'll run through it as quickly as possible. That's brilliant. If you want to um, carry on, and then afterwards we'll have a few questions for you, I'm sure. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. And uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, can I firstly say thank, thank you for the opportunity of letting me present an update to you at this point. Um, I thought it was important, um, given that we've been involved in, carry in <coughs> some of the work already, um, that the committee be kept um, informed about how things are progressing. Um, I know that the team uh, furnished you with a short presentation brief, which I am very go briefly going to address, just for the purposes of this meeting. Um, by way of background information, I just wanted to say that um, the first, the first, well, PIP was introduced um, under the Welfare Reform 2015, which uh, got a, a brief mention there just very shortly ago, um, and has been in effect here in Northern Ireland since 2016. Sorry, um, Marie, can I just come in there and say to members that if they want to see your presentation, they have it available at the tabled pack, um, and your presentation starts on page three. Sorry for interrupting, Marie. Not at all, that's fine. Yes, so anyway, the, uh, as part of the legislation that introduced PIP, um, there was an agreement that there would be two reviews carried out, one at the two-year stage and one at the four-year stage. Uh, the first independent review was carried out by Walter Radar. Some of you, I'm sure, were involved with that at the time. And he um, presented his findings and his recommendations to the department back in June 2018. Um, the second review was then agreed, it was agreed in the legislation that it could be conducted two years later, so, and it's the second review that I have been appointed to, um, to, to report on. Um, I was appointed back in February, um, we had originally hoped that I would be reporting by June. <laughs> I, I think everybody realises what happened in March, and that was the end of that as an idea. Um, so. Uh, we then had to um, reschedule and, and now we're still in the process of gathering evidence. Anyway, the department, uh, along with me being appointed as the independent reviewer, the department also appointed a scrutiny group to provide me with some constructive challenge and to support me in terms of the work that I'm doing. And just by way of um, information for the committee, the independent um, scrutiny group. The members of that are Mary Ann Webb, who is, um, work, works in MenCap, Walter Radar, and Walter obviously carried out the first review, and I was very, um, I was delighted that he could come on to the scrutiny group from, for the purposes of continuity as much as anything, and experience as much as anything else. Siobhan Rooney, um, who uh, was a nurse and is also involved in a number of other organisations, um, and Siobhan was actually on the scrutiny group for the first independent review. And Magella McAteer, who is involved with the British Deaf Association. And I would have to say, 
um, that the scrutiny group has been nothing but uh, an advantage from my point of view um, in terms of carrying this work forward. As well as that, the department also appointed a support team um, from within the department to assist me. And Patricia, who's also on this call, is one of the members of that support team. Um, and again, their assistance has been invaluable in terms of work that I've been doing so far. Very briefly to outline the terms of reference that I am working under, um, there are five terms of reference. One is to evaluate progress made on recommendations across the first review. Um, and uh, Obviously, Walter made 14 recommendations in his findings. Ten of those were either partially or fully accepted by the department at the time, and four, for various reasons, weren't. Um, and obviously, we're looking at um, how all of the recommendations that were made previously, how they've been implemented, and what progress has been made in that regard. I think, um, just from the point of view of bringing the committee up to date, it would be safe to assume that some, well, it would be safe to say at this point in time, and I know when I spoke to you, Kelly, and also to you, Andy, um, I, was, I was pointing out that it, it would be safe to assume that some of the recommendations that weren't accept, accepted by the department will come round again not the least of which was the six month rule around um, terminal illness and so forth and long term conditions. So, um, and I, I suppose I, I wouldn't be breaking any confidence by saying that uh, certainly political representatives that I've been talking to across the board have indicated that they would be very willing to look at that if it was a recommendation. The second um, term, the second reference term that I have to address is to evaluate the awareness and the experience of the PIP assessment process for new applicants, for those whose awards are, be, awards are being reviewed and for people who are reporting changes in circumstances. And I'll give you a wee bit of background information in a, in a bit more detail in a couple of minutes. The third um, terms, a term of reference is to evaluate the process to ensure that the most appropriate assessment types um, are being used and you'll be aware, I'm sure, any of your constituency work or any of you who have contact with PIP applicants, that there are normally three types of assessment. It can be paper-based um, or it can be face-to-face -face, and that face-to-face -face can be either in a, an assessment centre or in the person's own home. I would have to say COVID-19 has created another um, layer within that. And, and we are looking at that and undoubtedly there will be some comments in relation to the report around that and perhaps learning to be taken from it. But at the moment, the department have moved to exclusively telephony-based reviews. Well, paper-based reviews will continue, of course, where they're appropriate, but where there's um, need for contact with the claimant, they have moved now to telephony-based um, uh, reviews. So, and that's thrown up a whole load of information for us as well. The fourth uh, term of reference I have is to evaluate the effectiveness of the arrangements for ensuring accurate reporting. And uh, that has involved talking to not just individual claimants, and I'll show how we've done that in a minute or two, but also talking to various advocacy groups um, various other professional bodies who would be involved with claimants who are making applications for PIP um, and getting an opinion from the, all of those people as to how they are seeing reports being either accurate, accurate, either accurately reflecting their experience or inaccurately affecting their experience. And we do see both, I have to say, and have seen both in, in our feedback. And fifthly, I am looking at evaluating how effectively further evidence is being used to assist the correct claim decision being made. Exploring the balance between the amount uh, of how, how much and the type of evidence that's being asked for and what we're asking people to provide in relation to it. And interestingly enough, I met just this morning with the British Medical Association and had some... <coughs> discussion with them in relation to the roles of GPs, etc., in, in the production of that further medical evidence. So that was all, uh, and that, that has, is presenting, it would be safe to say, comments are coming back both pro and con in relation to some of that. Mm -hmm. The call for evidence is open, as I said, at the moment. Um, it was launched, the call for evidence was actually launched on the 4th of March 
as I indicated, we had hoped that we would be able to close that by the end of April and then get report to the committee or to the department and to the assembly by the end of June. That obviously wasn't possible and many people did contact me and ask for an extension or, or for me to ask for an extension. I did and the committee or the department were more than happy to ex allow for the call for evidence to be extended to the 16th of October. So please bear that in mind in terms of any of you who want to make responses to to us, it, it has to be done prior to that date. The call for evidence is aimed at both organisations and individuals. Um, and in relation to that, uh, when I was appointed and we developed the timetable for the call for evidence, initially we decided to try and do it in a number of ways. One of the ways that we wanted to try and get public input was through a survey, an online survey that has that is available on the departmental website. Um, the survey was developed in line with the terms of reference and asks questions to try and glean information for each of those. Um, it, the survey is in two parts on the departmental website. The first part is designed for individuals, um, in other words, claimants or those who um, support claimants, perhaps family members, friends, uh, whatever, um, who would assist them in making applications and the questions that are directed at those individuals and those who help the individuals are experienced in their making of the claim, in undergoing the assessment and in receiving their final decision. And there are about 20 or 22 questions, I think, in the first part of the questionnaire. We wanted to try and keep it manageable in terms of time that it takes to respond and so forth. And then there's a second part of the survey which is available to, uh, again, on the website, and it's designed to um, for organisations who have experience of the PIP process to complete. So they're also asked some of the questions around making the claim undergo on the assessment and their experience of how the final decision is made. But we're also asking them to give evidence um, around the or information about the further gathering of evidence and that sort of thing, and also the implementation of the suggested recommendations from the first review. So that, that was the first port of call, I suppose, whenever I call, issued the call for evidence in the first instance, but I'm, I'm not wedded to that as the only mechanism for um, comment and for input to come to us, to me as the independent reviewer. Um, I'm also happy to talk to groups individually and to um, meet with a broad range of um, those who have experience of the process and that would include the claimants themselves of course, the advocacy organisations who are involved in um, assisting them but also health professionals and others who for one reason or another might be involved in the process either in terms of providing further evidence or supporting somebody through the whole application process. It also includes the political parties and as I've already indicated and as Kelly and Andy have indicated, I've, I've spoken to um, at least five I think of the political parties so far and I think of a couple more which are in the pipeline for the next few weeks. And obviously constituency office um, personnel within all of your political parties and all of the the constituency offices have some experience at this level and some of the information that I've gained from those meetings is also invaluable, I would have to say. I want to reinforce the issue about the call for evidence. Um, it does close on the 16th of October. Um, the survey monkey that's out there, we've had some, we've had some moderate response to date. Um, over 300 people have come gone into part one. About a third of those have went through it completely. Um, others have left it at a very early stage. Um, part two, we've had uh, 27 responses have been noted and 11 of them have been fully uh, completed at this stage. So we're looking forward very much to, um, and we are already compiling themes out of the responses that we've got so far. Um, 
The other, the other area that we have been looking at, and some of you may be familiar with it and may have been involved with it at some stage, is we have been work, or looking at the information that was gathered last September by the all-party working group on um, learning disability. Um, and th they carried out some comprehensive research and, find, and looked at some findings with a view to feeding it into the review that was, they knew was going to happen this year. Um, and that has proved also invaluable. And I suppose I should say at this point, even though the numbers from our perspective in relation to the survey at the moment mm -hmm. are low or lower than I would like them to be at the final date, um, it, the indications are that the themes that are coming up are exactly the same as the themes that were coming up a year ago. Um, and that's not surprising. And it is also somewhat reassuring from our point, from my perspective, um, in terms of this review. Um, I have also um, completed a significant number of meetings with various, as I say, organisations. Um, I've had uh, about 23 completed meetings at the moment. Ten of those have been with community and voluntary sector organisations with 19 represent, organisations represented at those meetings. Five, as I say, have been with political parties and representatives from political parties. I've had four meetings with healthcare professionals and medical. Um, well, five now, actually, because we met with the BMA this morning. I've also had two meetings with the department to date. Um, that includes their um, health assessment advisor and um, the departmental officials who are working directly within the PIP um, project and I have meetings set up with those uh, individuals and some of the staff within those departments over the next few weeks. I've had an initial meeting with Capita and a short follow-up meeting um, and intend to have another couple of meetings with Capita before the report is finalised and I've also met with um, <coughs> one individual claimant in their own right. So. That is um, more or less where I'm at with the call for evidence. Um, we, the um, methodology is as I've explained it. So we have um, the call for evidence, the meeting with staff from the departments, PIP staff and capital staff, and then meetings with representatives, organizations, charities, support and disability organizations. Um, I'm very keen to get comments in whatever shape or form people want to make them and um, I'm happy to take them in that format as well. Uh, so, and all of the information can be submitted to the department, um, the information is all on the departmental website. I should say of course I am totally independent of the department but they are of course facilitating uh, the gathering of this information at this point in time. <coughs> And that's really, from a briefing point of view, that's really to bring you up to date with where I am at at the moment. I do want to give you the opportunity to take a few minutes to see if any of the, the committee would like to ask any questions in relation to the review to date. Bear in mind that I, I know I've already met with Kelly and Andy. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, I've, actually, I was going to come in and take my opportunity as acting chair today to ask you a few questions. There are a few members have already indicated, so we have a lot of people very interested today. Um, I was going to ask you how much COVID had impacted um, your your evidence gathering, but it seems to be that it's it's not holding you back too much. Is that fair to say? Well, we did um, create a bit of a blip at the beginning. And I think not dissimilar to the experience that everybody had, but once we got the technology up and working, it, it seems to have um, evened out, if you like. Now, <coughs> excuse me, it, it's not it, virtual meetings are not necessarily my preferred option for all of the meetings that I um, would like to have conducted, but certainly they've made it possible to do the work that I needed to do um, fundamentally. The one area I suppose where it is, um, it has impacted is obviously the observations of the assessment process. So um, we had, I had hoped that I would be able to watch um, and observe ass assessments 
where they were happening, basically. But obviously, that's now had to be all done by telephony. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is throwing up some issues um, around uh, the ability to gather information from my perspective. But to be fair, I've also asked the disability assessors and the claimants who have agreed to let me sit in on their experiences of the telephony. And there are mixed reports about it as well. Some are enjoying it uh, much more than they had initially expected. Uh, some prefer it, but some people, including claimants, have said they would much prefer to be able to meet with the assessor and show them what their, what their actual situation is. So, fundamentally, no, I've been able to conduct my own meetings, but um, not always in the idealist of circumstances. Thank you very much for that, Ashley. We're like a well... Um, rehearsed, it seems like a dance here, because I was just coming on to that telephony-based um, assessments. Um, you had mentioned that part of your team um, has a representative that is the someone from the deaf community. I was just wondering, with te <coughs> telephony-based um, reviews and paper-based reviews, that causes some difficulties. Are your team looking at that accessibility piece for the assessment types that are used? Well, we've met, um, obviously Magella works with the uh, British Deaf Association and has been invaluable in terms of feeding information in, in, in her day, day job role um, and was very kind enough, kindly organised two meetings with me for um, people with, who are deaf or, or have a hearing impairment. Um, now, we were able to do those and certainly some of them were thrown up the issue um, well, obviously there is an issue about accessibility um, for those who are hard of hearing. But there was the other issue that was being thrown up, and it's to do with the uh, with replacing that face-to-face -face meeting, if you like, with either telephony or um, a paper supply and information. Is very often mem members of the deaf community were indicating that English is not their first language. Obviously, sign is their first language. And um, that was presenting them with some difficulties. So yes, there there are complications. But to be fair, both the um, Magellan's organisation, the British Deaf Association, and we also met with the um, Deaf Children's uh, Association. And both organisations are attempting to cope put coping mechanisms into place to enable uh, people to get the information that they need and also access to the claim, claiming process that they need to go through. So, Thank you very much. I'm going to hand over to my committee members now because I've hogged you too much, Marie. Um, I'll go first of all to Sinead Ennis, please. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Marie. Um, <coughs> I know we spoke at the conversation at the start about um, meeting different political parties, and I know ourselves and Sinn Féin are due to meet with you next week. Um, yep. So I think somebody mentioned at the start about the, the six month rule and ourselves will be very much in support of changing that but I know we can we can speak more about that next week whenever we do have the chance to to meet. Um, I suppose my questions are similar to Kelly's but maybe coming at it from a different angle. Um, in terms of COVID, you know, how will it be factored actually into the review given the fact that it will have increased the number of, of fresh claimants? Um, and also, you know, we spoke a lot today about you know switching from face to face to um, telephone um, and paper based, but um, you know is it nearly too early to get an assessment of um, uh, of how that will have effect? You know how, how, what effect that will have had? You know um, and is it too early maybe to, for that to be factored into your final recommendations? It, it would be well to take the first question. Um, the uh, or maybe the second question first, I think. It is a bit early, because, simply because the, um, the process is a relatively new one. Um, so if, while there's absolutely no doubt that COVID will have to be um, acknowledged within the report, it, it will also ha we'll also have to acknowledge the um, structures that have been put in place to cope with it. The findings might slightly longer term um, although I would imagine that by the time December or well I'm hoping to have my report uh, where it will be in the right up stage up till the end of November more or less so um, by that stage there should be some findings coming out and hopefully some learning I I'll give you an example um, 
One of the things that is that that has been raised around the telephony assessments is, uh, and the question that has been asked around the telephony assessments is, are they being recorded? Because if you remember back, one of the recommendations under the first review was around recording of um, assessments, both to protect the, the disability assessor and the claimant in terms of the information that was being exchanged. <coughs> but um, and the. And that had been partially implemented by the department, but has subsequently sort of fallen by the wayside right? because obviously they're not doing any house or face to face anymore. But um, one of the questions that has been asked is about the recording of telephony assessments, which is not happening at the moment. And I imagine there might be something. I, I wouldn't, not that I want to jump the gun in relation to the recommendations at this stage, but I think it'd be safe to say that um, there will be some consideration have to be given to that. Um, and some mention of that and potentially a recommendation in relation to it. I don't know if that answers your question fully, um, but that's certainly one example of where I think we will have some learning and some potential recommendation coming out of it. The other issue is going to be um, it, it, it will deter, it, there can be some findings, I think, from the telephony stuff that's going on at the moment. The difficulty is that there are a lot of reviews and so forth that have been stalled, basically. So at the moment, most of the um, most of the cases that I've been listening into anyway have been either new claims or um, ones that had hit, you know, hit somebody's desk prior to the, the COVID, um, and were, they were trying to clear them up. Whereas um, other people are now being their their awards are being extended um, mm -hmm. for a period of time. So it's hard to judge yet what the learning will be out of that. But we'll certainly be looking at it as we move forward. Okay, Sinead? Yeah, no, I'll not hog the meeting because I know we're meeting next week. So, Thank you very much. Um, I, I have a f I've quite a few of the committee members have come in now. We're going to go um, online to um, Paula Bradley, please. And then it's Fra, Jonathan Buckley, and then Robin Newton, just in that order. Paula? Oh, have we lost Paula? She's forever there she is. Oh. She's forever shouting at people. Like Sorry. Hi, Paula. <laughs> I heard that from a can. Yeah, from um, <laughs> thank you, and thank you, um, Marie, for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to, I suppose it's following on with Kelly when she was talking about the deaf community. I, As constituency MLAs, we mm -hmm. have had numerous complaints about PIP, uh, about overturning decisions. But one of the things that was highlighted to me a few years ago, and I did have a meeting with the department and Capita back in 2016, it was, and it was surrounding those that are on the, the spectrum and notification of, of uh, you know, face-to-face -face meetings or whatever that might be with back then in 2016, and also the planning around that. And I know that that was quite successful, that meeting that was held then with, I think it was the National Autistic Society uh, and the Department of Capita. Um, just to ask you, uh, have you been speaking to NAS or, or to Autism NI? And is that theme still reoccurring um, where uh, people who are on the spectrum are still having great difficulties um, with the system? Um, I don't believe uh, in my uh, autism and I haven't come back to request a meeting yet, although there is, of course, still time. We did notify all of those organisations about the opportunity. Some did come back and said, look, it might be very much later, much later in the process, just simply because of, of what they're having to contend with at the moment and whether or not they have access to everything that they need. Um, but yes, we, I mean, I'm keen to hear from anybody um, in relation to that. Um, some uh, advocacy organisations have raised issues, particularly, and um, not necessarily just about autism, but um, learning disability, for example, um, can create very significant um, disadvantages and obstacles um, when people are trying to make their applications. And uh, I mean, very often, um, one of the issues that has arisen again, and I don't think I'd be breaching anything at this stage to say this, is that um, there's still some concerns around the, the need to um, marry up the, the person who's doing the assessment with the condition that is being experienced and under, well, it, even not necessarily having the experience, but at least knowing what the condition 
um, how it materialises um, for various individuals. Um, so the, that I know came around with the first review and it looks as if it's still there um, oh. in terms of how things are being dealt with. Um, so while I haven't spoken to uh, the um, Autism NI or anything like that, um, I would say a similar issue has been raised with others, maybe for a different condition, but um, but not, and not a dissimilar not a dissimilar situation. So, and those are all things that we are looking at at the moment and taking evidence on. So, and I, I don't think I would be jumping the gun at this stage to say that in all probability there'd be some recommendation coming around that again even though it wasn't accepted by the department in the first instance. But it, it, nuanced, it might be slightly different in terms of recommendation, but... And I mean, I, I know after that meeting that I had back in 2016, um, there was a difference was made, and it was it was it was exactly as you say, matching people and training people to have an understanding mm -hmm. of various disabilities. And when, when we look at, at ASD, uh, especially when you look at you know the literal approach. Um, that, that people that suffer from ASD may have in answering some of those questions. Um, and it was asking then that Capita had an understanding of that, which they just didn't seem to, to take uh -huh. into account at all. So, no, that, that, that's good. I mean, it doesn't matter which disability it might be, um, that there is an understanding there of, of that, why that person would answer in a certain way, even what they're, what they're saying. Yes. And I think it, to, to take your point in relation to that, uh, and interestingly enough, I met with um, someone last week, I think it was, and they were indicating they had to do some work with the cystic fibrosis, um, one of the cystic fibrosis charities, and they had actually taken the initiative themselves and went to Capita and trained them about the condition. And that's, that's fine if that works. But the other issue that we've had, and it's been raised by a number of advocacy organisations, is turnover of staff as well, and how you maintain that, um, the level of knowledge, if you like, because you can train, and then if people move on, or um, how, how, do you, how do you keep that level of knowledge within the organisation? Yep, so those great. are all things, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you okay. very much. Um, Paula Framacan. Sure, thank you very much, and uh, Marie, you're very, very welcome. And thank you. Uh, I know that uh, with your experience, that uh, that it's in the uh, investigation or thing is in good hands. But uh, and the, the the both Kelly and Paula have raised the thing, and one of the, I think one of the things that uh, people have been uh, concerned about over many years is uh, people uh, who uh, suffer from various. Uh, illnesses, whether it's mental illnesses or uh, physical illnesses, you know, and, and the, the, the Kelly uh, mentioned uh, the deaf community, Paula mentioned uh, the sp people with spectrums and li the, like say autism and, th and things like that, but also the partially sated and uh, people suffering from uh, bipolar uh, syndrome. So there's a whole lot of things on that, that obviously needs, needs to take on, uh, on board. And uh, it's just, uh, again, that the, the, uh, you have touched on it somewhat about how extensive uh, your engagement has been and how it has compared the, the, to the, 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 the last review that was done. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm obviously trying to get as an extensive uh, engagement as I can for her because obviously the, and any review is only as good as the information that's fed into it. So I would encourage, and I was going to take the opportunity to say to all of you, um, before we finish, that um, if you can encourage people to respond as much as possible by the 16th deadline, that would be extremely useful. But you're absolutely right. Um, there are a broad range of conditions. And to be fair, we cannot expect, um, nor would we expect, um, disability assessors to be fluent in all of them. <laughs> um, I, I don't think it, it wouldn't be possible for anybody to be fluent in all of them, but um, well, it is essential, I think, and this is one of the things that I'm looking at and we're investigating further with Capita, is how they are dealing with situations where, yes, the people who carry out the assessments may, be, um, may have health professional experience, but how do we know that they have sufficient in the particular condition that they're evaluating at that particular time? Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to meet with them to look at their training needs um, 
an out this uh, process and all of that sort of thing and see what they have in place around that and certainly we'll be commenting on that, there's no doubt about it. Sure, and just to, just to one, one final thing, and it's probably uh, the, the effect that uh, many people, uh, that's uh, the, the, I think the, the key element to restoring uh, confidence in, in all this, especially the PIPs thing, uh, is to uh, ensure that the provision of welfare assessment assessments is moved from a private company uh, back into the, the, the department, because I believe that uh, people uh, would, would, would have more faith uh, and, uh, and, and harsh assessments are carried out, and we all remember the old assessments uh, when you'd, you had doctors, you had uh, people who were uh, trained up uh, for the, for these things. And I, think, Paula, we we done a visit uh, as I say now back in the day, if you remember, uh, and that was at the, the one of the uh, sessions, and it was actually quite frightening uh, to, to, to sit through the thing. Uh, have you any thoughts on that, uh, Marie? Well, interestingly enough, that actual the, the issue about the outsourcing for the healthcare professionals has come up on a number of in a number of meetings that I've held, and we are holding that at the moment. Um, we're obviously looking at um, there's there's there have been some developments in other areas. Uh, Scotland, for example, have been attempting, I think, to to do more in-house work in relation to that. Um, so at the moment we are trying to get information about that. We know that DWP in Britain have also um, are also talking about piloting something around in-house assessment as well. So I, I'm, I'm going to look at all of that and see. But undoubtedly that is an issue that has been raised. So I'll be commenting of, on it to some degree or another. Obviously, it's not within the big work of the review to tell the department how to conduct its business in that regard, but um, but inevitably, I would say there have to be comments about the, the outsourcing of the healthcare professionals. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Fra. Um, I'm going now to Jonathan on Starleaf, um, and then it'll be Robin, and then Mark Durkin. Hello. Thanks for, for your presentation thus far. I suppose probably it's the same theme uh, as most have commented on, uh, given the fact that COVID-19 has, has changed the landscape completely at, at this time and the move towards telephony has, has been well documented. Uh, and I think I don't just speak for myself, but for other elected members, uh, the sooner that those face-to-face -face meet meetings can uh, commence within the health guidelines, it, it would be a welcome start. Uh, but given that we are where we are, um, we don't always plan to be in this position. We, we, we hope that someday in a post-COVID environment, whenever that will be, that we can get back to normality. With that in mind, is your review a fair representation of the actual reality as to uh, the, the normal circumstances as opposed to in the COVID environment? And how, how can that be reflected in a review, given that you've already said your inability to observe assessments in the traditional manner in which they would have been carried out has, has all been lost in the COVID environment? Well, th thanks, Jonathan. And fortunately for me, I suppose, um, even though this review, uh, this my input in relation to the review is taking place in a, in a very challenging um, environment, I think it would be safe to say, I'm absolutely also able to rely on a number of other bits of evidence that are being submitted to me. I mentioned earlier um, the um, report, a report that, that has been developed by the um, all-party group on learning disability, and they very kindly said that they would share their data with me. They had initially carried this out last year with a view to feeding into the review this year anyway, so it has, it has uh, proved fortuitous, I suppose, in that sense that they've been able to do that. So some of the data that that they have been able to develop over the last year, I will be able to use. And the other area that I am also looking at, um, and will be making some of a, a meeting scheduled already with the the new incumbent in the um, uh, public service ombudsman's role, uh, Margaret Kelly. And I'm going to be meeting with Margaret because you'll all be aware, I'm sure, that the Ombudsman had initiated a, an investigation about a year and a half ago, or maybe 
well, about a year and a half ago, roughly. Um, and I know they have done some work and they're also potentially, well, at this point in time, I, I, I obviously have to talk to them, but we'll certainly be comparing notes, let's say, um, in relation to some of the findings that they've been able to get. So I'm hopeful that um, the information that I'm gathering now will obviously be, uh, the, the backdrop of COVID will be behind some of it, but there is other information out there that I am able to glean over the last two years, which I think will make it um, relevant. Um, even, even, even though these circumstances are what they are at the moment, we hopefully will move to a more normal situation as we move forward. So hopefully I'll be able to balance the two. Okay, and just uh, finally, thanks for your answers thus far. Um, what has been the engagement, and I, I might have missed this in your presentation with the, the independent advice sector, uh, I know probably constituency offices, and you did mention they are they are a front line now in dealing with a lot of PIP applications, and unfairly so, if I may add, in a lot of circumstances, because constituency offices, and I'm sure I can speak for, for all the other parties, can become somewhat overwhelmed with the detail that is required within the PIP process, whether that's representation or otherwise. Um, given that there is funding available, I think uh, organisations such as uh, my own citizen, uh, citizens' advice, etc., and there's, there is uh, benefit rel related uh, funding for, for those that specialise in that industry. Do, do you believe that that is being utilised fully? Uh, I, I know that the constant backdrop for those that have PIP inquiries and other benefit related inquiries comes straight to a constituency office of whether that's an MLA or an MP or indeed even a councillor. Uh, but the specialist advice in which they could uh, glean is via these uh, the independent advice sector, and sometimes I feel that that is a gap missing in in the the puzzle to ensure that those uh, most in need are identified and have the best opportunity and chance to success. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I could say that I have met with a significant number of organisations already who are in the. Would, would be classed as the advice field, if you like. Um, I've mentioned earlier that I've completed, I have 10 meetings so far with community and voluntary organisations, and within that, 19 rep uh, organisations were represented, most of which were advice agencies, I have to say, mm -hmm. or very, very specialist organisations in certain conditions. Um, now, I absolutely agree with you. There is an issue, uh, well, and well, to, to make it clear, I suppose, the advice agencies are there and they're at the front line, there's no doubt about that, as are most our constituency offices, as you've highlighted. But um, one of the issues that constituency office workers have raised with me when I've been talking to them is the fact that they, they're, not, they're not advice workers, per se, mm -hmm. um, and they don't have the same training that an advice worker does. Some of them have been through the process, but some haven't. Um, and uh, they find, find that very challenging and also um, not just challenging but worrying from their own points of view that they're doing the right thing and all the rest of it. Um, so it, it does strike me that there is definitely, well, in the experience that I've had so far in relation to talking both claimants and the advocacy organisations and the political parties, it would strike me that there's definitely a need for advocacy to help people through this process. Mm -hmm. um, the advice agencies are certainly, in their opinion, doing what they can in relation to it, but that doesn't mean that there wouldn't need to be more of it. <laughs> yeah. um, the, and the other issue that um, I was that it has just arisen in response to some queries that have come up with me um, just within the last couple of weeks, there was an issue about uh, developing an easy read um, claim form uh, for, for the purposes of PIP. Um, and in our in my investigations, the, the team would often did, did some um, investigating as to whether it's possible to get this or not. But we've been told by both DWP and the department here that the form is too complicated to make it an easy read um, version. It tells and, you a lot. Uh, sorry? That tells you a lot about the... Well, uh, to be fair, it, it, when I heard that, I thought, hmm, this is a benefit that's supposed to be out there for the most vulnerable people. <laughs> and if the most vulnerable people are in a position where they don't understand it, then not only is advocacy needed, it is essential. Yeah. No, so, I... 
Your so point, your, that gives you some reassurance about yeah. where I would no, likely be coming from. I, I, I would 100% agree with you in terms of the, the conversations that you've had. And I understand that would be across different constituency offices of political parties. Okay. The, the, the specialties are not there within constituency offices, given the in, all, already increasing demand on constituency services for a plethora of, of different issues, that the specialty and the time that PIP applications deserve if there is funding through this system in the advice sector, uh, there has to be uh, a legitimate way of, of, of them taking up that bulk of the work in terms of case uh, work around the application because we're in danger of duplicating the system. Uh, and that is only adding further bureaucracy into the system and uh, a backlog in uh, cases whether that's positive or those most in need. And, and I think that's streamlining of the ability to access that practice is something that really needs to be taken into account by uh, any review. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I'm going to move on now to yeah. Robin and then Mark. Andy, do you want to come in as well? I'm Grant. You're okay, Kelly. no problem. Robin, I'll come to you and then to Mark. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Marie, for your presentation. It's extremely useful. Um, wish you well with the outcomes of it. Um, can I, I, I'd just like to build on uh, something that uh, Paula said and perhaps take it a bit wider. Uh, I, I, I've, I've been at tribunals with a constituent when the constituent has just got up and walked out uh, of, of the appeals panel. Much, not, nothing to do with the chairing of it um, uh, and I do find I have to say that over the past few years appeals panels have improved greatly I think there's a much more sympathetic view from the uh, members of the appeals panels than may have been uh, a number of years ago but I do think there is a, a, a gap and Paula uh, started it but it is wider than the autism aspect it's the larger mental health issue where, uh, and you've already referred to it, where uh, the capita folk, and I don't see how it is possible for them to have the breadth of range if they're just issued cases uh, to, de to deal with. Um, and uh, dealing with that mental health issue is an area which I think requires uh, much greater um, training, understanding, experience, and indeed, as we go over the next couple of years, I think the, the issue is going to become even more difficult uh, in 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 that area. And I think that transfers also into the appeals panel. Um, I, I'm I'm not quite sure that uh, the appeals panel is perhaps always. Uh, made up of people who have the mental health experience when you have a, perhaps someone who is a, a GP, someone who has a, a legal mind and someone who understands uh, the disability issues. So I, I don't know how you get around the, the breadth of the problem, but I think it is an issue that does need to be identified within the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, it, I, I suppose what I'm doing is looking at the process from start to finish. So, and certainly it has come up in the early stages where the capital assessment is being done and the need for specialist support both for the, the claimants themselves but, but also for the disability assessors to ensure that they, yeah. In, in, well, in the phrase that I used, they, they know what they don't know, if you know what I mean, whenever they're going into an assessment, um, and that they make themselves um, familiar with the situation that the, that the claimant is experiencing. I, I, I absolutely agree with you, um, Robin. I'm not sure how um, you would cover everything. Um, and I suppose from my point of view, the appeal tribunals, while I am looking at their impact in relation to the PIP process, um, and I'm meeting with John Duffy in um, about two, two or three weeks' time, um, so I'll be able to thrash out maybe and, and get some more information from him in relation to that. It, it's not exactly within the remit of the review to make recommendations around, because the, the appeal tribunal um, 
or the Tribunal Appeal Service is, is outside of the um, PIP scenario, if you know what I mean. But but the point uh, the point I suppose I'm trying to make is to try and ensure that the experience that people have in the appeal process is adequate to what they need. And that's where I will be asking questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And Mark Darkin. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Marie, uh, for the presentation and for the work that you've been doing on this. It's clear that you have been busy. I suppose I should mention, and I know other have, others have, that we have spoken on this uh, recently, and it's evident that even since then uh, you've done quite a bit more work. Uh, it's funny what Johnny was saying there about the expertise within constituency offices. I'm a member of staff short, short today of someone else second. Darren and my other colleagues doing a PIP form as we speak with someone. And I've genuinely had, had to lock the door because people just, just keep coming in. Uh, committee members will be aware of the difficulty I had with working from home and trying to keep the children at bay during lockdown, but it's positively tranquil compared to the office here. Uh, Marie, and, and you know, you'd, you'd spoken to BMA this morning, was it? You, you said, I was just wondering if maybe you'd be at liberty to expound on that a, a, a wee bit and say how you'd get on with them because it, it is an issue that, that people have come to us with in the past and the not too di distant past particularly I suppose uh, since the onset of COVID it was difficult enough to get access to some uh, GPs and some practices and, and to get the additional information that was required from them at the best of times but uh, since lockdown and this as we work our, our way out of that, and, and, and some GP surgeries are, are slower at doing that than others, I'm sure with, with good reason. Uh, what are BMA saying about that? Well, now they didn't. We did. We didn't go into the actual operation of surgeries or um, um, how the service was being delivered in that regard. My my um, communication with them was pretty specific about the, the uh, further evidence issue. They did um, indicate that, that there's no doubt that this current um, situation has presented them with difficulties in that regard, although they were also raising that they had difficulties in that regard anyway. Um, yes. even, even if there was no COVID, uh -huh. it, it would still be difficult. Um, so, uh, and uh, as I say, I, it was a brief meeting this morning um, with a, a few questions really that I wanted answers to. Initially, they they have they will submit their official response by the by the sixth the deadline of the sixteenth. So I'll have more information at that stage. But I mean, fundamentally, what they're saying is that um, they have great difficulty with the process that's being used at the moment in relation to the call for further evidence. In other words, they're saying that as medical professionals, they they want to they can deal in fact, not observation if you know what I mean. So um, one of the issues that was raised with me in some of the communication that I've had with advocacy groups, for example, is, and with the constituency office staff, was that when a medical report comes in and says, um, the, the patient indicated to me that, and I raised that question with them, but, but they said that's all they can do <laughs> because they're not being asked direct medical questions uh, because of the PIP process. They're being asked about functionality and yeah. they will admit to themselves that they're not really best placed to, to make those judgments because they only see the claimant maybe once every three months or once every six months or something, unless they're, if somebody's coming in every week for something. And one doctor that I spoke to also indicated that unless they actually do see the, the patient, the claimant, as it will be, um, on a very regular basis, it's very hard to, for them to answer some of the questions that they get asked um, because they are dealing, in fact, they're dealing in medication, condition, um, uh, the, any information they're gleaning from, the, from their um, consultations with particular claimants or patients in their, in their view. Um, and they want to say that they're advocating on behalf of the patient but they can only do it if they're asked very specific questions. So I think that that was one of the issues that came up this morning that was very clear to them. Um, it was very, very clearly a deficit for them in terms of the process. And was there any, uh, a few you espoused to suppose that 
uh, new multidisciplinary hubs that we have a few up and running, the right few now up and running, and that it's going to be rolled out even further uh, across the north. That might help people who find themselves sort of in this situation. I'm not sure that they were able to answer that question this morning, um, or, or even to address that question this morning, because um, the, what they're trying to do in relation to the, the process around PIP is to try and make sure that, that when people ask for their records, for example, that they're given the records that they need. Not, not everything, which is yeah. fundamentally what has what been handed out in some cases. Um, of and they the want GDPR issues as well. Often. Yes, yes, the GDPR issues are very, very prevalent from their perspective. Um, they're also, but they had they're very serious concerns about how the questions are being asked, not, not even just in relation to GDPR, but just in terms of proper fact-finding, um, although GDPR is a very big issue for them, and they say a very time-consuming issue for them. Okay, no, thank you, Marie. Uh, most of the other things I was going to ask have been covered, but thanks and good luck. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Robin, you wanted to come in with uh, another supplementary? A very short one, uh, Chair, thank you. Uh, Marie, uh, you're looking at the review process as well. Um, Maybe just a very short comment on when a person has a progressive disease and the initial award is made, difficult to get back into the system to have a review of the process as the disease progresses and the individual claimant then is much more incapacitated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are you suggesting, Robin, that that um, should be an issue that um, f falls within a recommendation, or because well, I mean, I'm looking at the recommendations in relation to if, I mentioned earlier about the six-month rule around terminal illness. Yes. But there's also the issue about long-term conditions and yeah. degenerative conditions. Yes. Which I it's think, a degenerative yes, condition that uh, really yeah. is, is the issue where it, it's not terminable in the sense that it can be six yeah. months or a year, but indeed the quality of life for mm -hmm. the individual and the physical capabilities of the individual deteriorate over a long time. And where yeah. an award may have been made on the primary diagnosis of the illness, mm -hmm. As the progression goes made to get back into the system and have the reward reviewed, always with the potential that an award can be removed as well as an award can be increased. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. No. That's definitely, and that has come up as an issue as well. So that's definitely something we'll be com commenting on. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. I just want to double check, Paula, your hand is still up. Is that from before or have you another question you would like to come in? Hi, yes, sorry. Thank you, Chair. No, I have another just a wee quick question, if that's OK. Yes, um, it was just following on from something that Mark said about um, the, the meeting with the, the BMA. Um, oh, uh, has it come up as well then with those charities that uh, look after those people with learning difficulties or learning disabilities. Because if you have a learning difficulty or disability, you may not have seen a GP in years or a, a consultant in years because you don't have a physical illness. So there's no illness there. So there's no way of getting medical evidence. Um, is there some way around that 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 can be changed in some way? Well, uh, thanks, Paula. And that is actually one of the things we're looking at. It was one that was raised by the um certainly by the Deaf Children's Association, because they were saying that once a child um, was identified as deaf, it, to, to all intents and purposes, that's the diagnosis, and that no other medical condition that requires, or potentially no other medical condition that requires constant observation, and that they'll only have interaction with the medical professionals if there's new developments, or you know, if, if cochlear implants, or different hearing aid um, things are developed. So that, that really is the only contact that they would have. So yes, that has come up definitely. And um, it's uh, one of the issues that we've raised in the questionnaire that we've submitted, we've asked people to comment on, or, or 
answer questions on was to ask them who else works with them, not not just GPs or, or maybe psychiatric <laughs> nurses or um, a nurse or whatever else, but other carers, other uh, even other family members who support them, and other organisations that they might interact with. I mean, many organisations, many community and voluntary organisations run programmes for people, and they would see them on a much more regular basis than a, than a medical professional would. So it's about trying to get supportive evidence from relevant agencies and relevant people. Um, and that includes carers and supportive organisations and all the rest. So I would imagine it's, it's been an issue, certainly, because most of the time the forum will just ask for information from your GP or something. We may certainly want to make a recommendation about broadening that out somewhat. OK, thank you. Thanks for that. Okay. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, I think as a carer myself, I'm absolutely delighted to hear that carers' views will be taken into consideration. I would just like to thank you. The committee has asked you a lot of questions today, and you've been very patient with us. I think we've all found that very useful, and I would like to thank you and your team, and we absolutely look forward um, to seeing your report. Hopefully, we'll see it on the 11th of December. And just for anybody who's watching this today, I'm not sure who watches committee meetings, but um, if anybody wants to... Um, add into the evidence, then they go to the communities-ni.gov.uk website and go into consultations and you'll see the questionnaire that Marie has been talking about. But thank you very much, Marie, to you and your team. Your time has been very appreciated today. Can I just say to you all, I know you have a very packed agenda and thank you very much for giving me this time. So thank you thank on, you. My, on my and my team's behalf. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. Members, I'm going to take you back. There, there now. Thank you very much. I'm going to take you back now to um, agenda item four, uh, page 16 of your pack, if you don't mind. Um, just going back to the um, dep departmental letter in relation to the amendments to the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Withdrawal Bill Legislative Consent Motion. And we should be joined now by Jerry McCann and Anne McCleary. I think both of them are coming online now by the power of technology. Jerry and Anne, are you there? Hello. 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 Yes, I'm, I'm here. Oh, I'm hi. here, yes. I'm here also. Hello there, folks. Um, thank you very much for coming along today. Just to explain to uh, the members that are present, um, you have come along today to um, quickly update the members as to the changes since the committee last considered the original LCM. Um, I'd like to hand over to yourselves then um, just to give us uh, an update on, that, on those amendments, please. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, we're very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you today about the wording of the legislative consent motion and the updated legislative consent motion relating to the Immigration and Social Security Coordination EU Exit Bill, which was shared with the committee last Thursday. As members are aware, the primary purpose of the bill is to end the EU's rules and free movement of persons at the end of the transition period, that is the 31st of December 2020. Immigration, international relations and freedom of movement within the EEA are accepted matters and are therefore the responsibility of the Home Office. However, this bill also makes provision for the Westminster Government or, where appropriate, a Northern Ireland Department to amend retained EU legislation relating to the Social Security Coordination Regime. At its meeting on the 8th of July, the Committee agreed, in principle, to the extension to Northern Ireland of the relevant provisions of the Bill through an appropriate legislative consent motion, and they published your, independent, your comprehensive re report. The decision of the Scottish Government not to proceed with a legislative consent motion resulted in 31 amendments being made to the Bill during report stage in the Commons. The Committee considered these amendments prior to giving its agreement and publishing its report. As a result, the legislative consent motion has been updated to reflect these amendments. The changes are very minor, essentially references to a devolved authority have been changed to a Northern Ireland Department to reflect the fact that Scottish ministers will have no power 
to amend retained EU law relating to social security coordination under the bill, but a Northern Ireland department will retain the power to do so. The committee's report anticipated that the wording of the legislative consent motion would be amended. The motion has now been amended to catch amendments to the bill since its introduction to Parliament. The motion now also states that, and I quote, the Assembly agrees in line with Section 87 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, that's the, the bit that's been changed, to the principle of the extension to Northern Ireland, unquote, of the relevant provisions of the bill. As you're aware, Minister Nicoulin has concerns about the use of the legislative consent process. <coughs> so this revised wording emphasises that this legislative consent motion is being taken forward in line with Section 87 of the Northern Ireland Act. As members know, Section 87 places a statutory duty on the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions and the Northern Ireland Minister to consult each other with a view to securing, to the extent agreed, single systems of social security, child support and pensions. It's now necessary for assembly consent for the LCM to be obtained prior to third reading of the bill in the Lords. Therefore, subject to Minister's consent, the intention is to table the motion as soon as possible. So that's an update. Uh, if you've got any queries about that, uh, Jerry and I, probably primarily Jerry, uh, but we're both happy to answer any questions that you've got. So, members, um, have you any comments, or are you content to note the amendments and support the revised LCM when it's, de when it's debated in plenary? I'm seeing nodding heads. Yes. No. Nobody on. Nobody sure. I think. Um, Jerry and Anne, you're getting away quite easy today. Then um, thank you very well, much. Well, that that does that does uh, well, that does happen very often, Chair. We're more than happy. <laughs> thank okay. you very much. Okay. Thank you for your time. I think I think we're going. Cheers. Thanks very I much. I think we're anyway. going. I think we're going to be back to see you next week as well, so you can look forward to that. <laughs> thank you very much. We'll see thank you again. Right. <laughs> thank Bye. you. Okay. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank bye you bye. Very much. Bye bye. Uh, Thank you, members. Um, we're moving on now to agenda item six, which is the Assembly Research Briefing on the Pension Schemes Bill. Um, mel uh, members, as you can see from your screens, Eleanor Murphy from the Assembly Research Services here via Starlight to brief us on her Pension Schemes Bill paper to support us with the committee stage of the bill. Members have been provided with the paper starting at page 30. By way of background, the Pension Schemes Bill was introduced into the Northern Ireland Assembly by the Minister for Communities on the 23rd of June 2020. The bill mirrors the provisions of the Westminster Pensions Act 2017, which introduced a new regulatory framework for the master's, master trusts and sought to regulate unfair member-borne commissioning charges and early exit charges. Eleanor, you're very welcome. Um, we're really looking forward to this because um, <laughs> any, any expertise you can in part to help the committee would be very welcome if you want to carry on with your briefing thank you yes thank you chair uh, good afternoon members um this is going to be a very high level 10 minutes just to refresh the committee's mind on the contents of the bill before you begin your clause by clause scrutiny so if i run through very quickly the three uh, main provisions within the bill and i'll not labor too much on the points because you've already received several departmental briefings so firstly, uh, if I turn to the provisions relating to master trusts, members are probably well versed by now on exactly what a master trust is, and you will be aware that there has been a rapid growth in the number and membership of master trusts over recent years, primarily due to the fact that they were a very good vehicle in which to deliver employer obligations under automatic enrolment. But the UK government argued, and this point was certainly agreed on by the then Work and Pensions Committee that looked to the issue, that master trusts were under-regulated. The pensions regulator had previously attempted to put in place a voluntary accreditation scheme, but both the regulator and the UK government felt that a more compulsory statutory framework was necessary. So that new framework was included in the Westminster Act, which you referred to, and the provisions are now contained within the Northern Ireland Pension Schemes Bill. It's perceived to be a very important piece of legislation for a number of reasons. Firstly, to protect the pensions interests of some of the lowest paid employees in Great Britain and Northern Ireland. 
Second, they are very important vehicles for small and micro employers to meet their automatic enrolment obligations. And thirdly, it's a multi-billion, uh, not a multi-million, a multi-billion pound section of the pensions industry. So the new regular scheme, regulatory scheme has a number of very detailed elements. I won't go over them all uh, in detail, but the most notable f uh, features are that a person cannot operate a master trust unless it is authorised. To receive authorisation, the trustees must apply to the pensions regulator and their application must include a whole range of very uh, detailed documents and information, such as the trust status accounts, the scheme's business plan and its continuity strategy. And members will want to note the continuity strategy is very important as this sets out how the interests of members will be protected during a triggering event. So there's more details and trigger events in the paper, but basically it's an incident that may compromise the financial viability of the organisation, although there are other trigger events within the, def the definition in the bill. To grant authorisation, the trust has to meet five criteria. And page 24 of my paper provides an extract from the Pensions Regulator, uh, mas the Pensions Regulator Master Trust Code of Practice, which is a statutory code of practice that's already in operation in Great Britain. And it provides a much more user-friendly synopsis of the criteria. So if I can go through those very quickly, all individuals must be assessed all individuals being assessed must be able to satisfy that they are fit and proper persons. So, for example, they don't have any specific convictions that would disqualify them from being classified as a fit and proper person. The master trust must have sufficiently robust IT and other processes such as governance processes in place to run efficiently and govern effectively. A master trust must demonstrate financial sustainability, and there are lots of pieces of evidence that a uh, master trust must provide the regulator to prove financial sustainability. So scheme funders must be a body corporate or a partnership and only carry out activities directly relating to master trust, although there are some exceptions to these. And trusts must have a robust continuity strategy with contingency planning, and essentially what the regulator for here is how will members be protected if a triggering event occur. The bill would also confer a number of important powers on the pensions regulator, which is already which is already exercising these powers in respect of trust covered by the Westminster Act. So, for example, it could refuse to issue authorisation, and there's an appeals mechanism associated with this. It can withdraw authorisation. It can, under certain circumstances, order trusts to pause certain activities like accepting new members on, onto the scheme. Provide the regulator with a suite of enforcement tools. So uh, they would allow them to impose civil penalties. They could issue fixed and escalating penalty notices if a trust refuses or neglects to provide certain information. So perhaps one of the most central parts of the legislation is the placing of a duty on a range of people involved in the trust to notify the regulator that a triggering or significant event has occurred. There are also provisions within the bill which would provide the regulator with ongoing super supervisory powers so the regulator is able to monitor the activities of trusts on an ongoing basis. Members are already aware that the regu this regulatory framework is already operation in Great Britain and has been for a number of years. We have one master trust in Northern Ireland, the Workers' Pension Trust, and it has already received authorisation from the regulator. And as required by legislation, it appears on a published list of authorised schemes. So in July of this year, the pensions regulator told me there were 38 master trusts that have received authorisation at that time and 28 trusts were also in the process of exiting the pensions trust market. market. Um, squeeze for time, so if I run over part two of the bill really quickly, um, part two would facilitate a ban on member-born commissioning charges, which are charges employees of a pension scheme are typically not aware of and do not necessarily receive any benefit from, and is hoped that this aspect of the bill would create much more transparency in terms of fees and charges. The second aspect is to facilitate the placing of a cap and a ban on early exit, exit charges, and these charges would be set out in support legislation. 
I should know the UK government has a pension freedom drive to enable over 55s to access pensions should they wish to do so. So research search showed that significant access charges by some providers was putting people off uh, uh, accessing their pensions early. So I'm far from a pensions expert, but I'm happy to take any uh, questions you have, and I don't know the answer. I'll take them away and come back to you. Thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, I would go as far as to say, as you know, an awful lot more about pensions than I do, but um, mm -hmm. I have a few questions for you. Um, in your bill paper, you noted that the department highlights that a new regulatory regime for master trusts has been <coughs> operating, as you mentioned, in GB England, Scotland and Wales since April 2018. Has your research shown any issues from those jurisdictions that we should be concerned about as we start to look at the bill? Nothing really jump, jumping out, sure, from um, any any information come from the, the devolved parliaments or, or committees. It's been a little more difficult to get, find information on how master trusts themselves, uh, how, what their experience was of the new regulatory, regulatory um, process. So perhaps if you're receiving evidence from the pensions regulator, you could perhaps ask them um, whether, you know, whether master trusts find this to be an onerous or an overly onerous process or, and also whether perhaps they're going to review the process in the number of years. Thank you. Um, I noticed there on page 33 of your paper, which is our page 60 in the Members Pack, um, the pensions regulator can impose civil penalties, fixed and escalating penalty notices. Um, what are these penalties in monetary terms? And I know on page 33, um, you have ones there. It's the escalating penalty notice that goes up like a thousand pounds a day. Um, is that the sort of figures that we're looking at? Uh, the escalating penalty notice and the, the fixed penalty notice, I think, will be the set will be included in subordinate legislation. But what the table that you have that you're referring to is the current um, escalating pensions notice that um, that is, is applicable to master trusts in Great Britain. Okay. So. Um, so the, the, the pensions regulator can impose civil penalties for things like um, if a person is found to be uh, operating master trust without authorization, it can impose an individual penalty of £5,000 and also £50,000, but it refers to in any other case. Now, I'm not sure what that means, any other case. I take it it's maybe on an organisational level. If they can't identify an individual a discrepancy, maybe they would impose a fine on the organ a penalty on the organization <coughs> could those sort of fines have, have an implication um on the people who are part of that you know have their pension with that master trust does that delve into um their pot of money for their pensions yeah i think quite right so then the end a whole range of individuals would be subject to to the penalties so it would have a very costly impact if they were found not not to be operating in a transparent environment. Yeah, OK. Uh, my final question before I go to Fraz, the first that has indicated, um, a number of the master trusts across the UK are exiting the market. Um, have, you any, have you come up with why you think that may happen or may be happening? Yeah, this appears to be due to consolidation. So a lot of smaller master trusts are exiting the market for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that they may not have the infrastructure in place to to cope with such a rigorous uh, authorization process. So the pensions regulator hasn't has played quite a role in this in terms of overseeing that that is managed correctly. That members who are in smaller trusts are assumed correctly into authorized. Trust. So that's another issue. Maybe you want you want to discuss with the pensions regulator. Should they give oral evidence? Thank you very much, Eleanor. I'll move on now to Fra. Sure, and uh, I think that uh, was one of the key questions, and it was one of the questions that I was uh, going to ask. You know, because there there there, there was a, a number of concerns raised at the time when this was being uh, uh, implemented, and 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 uh, uh, people were just a bit weary about it, and. The, the likes of, and Eleanor said, you know, master trusts are run on, on a profit basis, as it says in the thing. And uh, always when you have the profit motive there, as it says, and, and the document that raises uh, so many concerns is who has control over the money, how it's spent, uh, 
uh, Harrods managed in earning, and uh, as you said, it's a, a multi-billion uh, pound uh, operation. Uh, but have we any idea uh, how much, say, on a, on a, a yearly basis, instead of taking on the thing in the north, how much is uh, local people paying in this scheme from uh, the as profit to uh, uh, the the, the organisation, and uh, the the just well, that would be basically it. You know, I think it's one of the questions I raised uh, back then. You know, that was there a controller uh, that ensured that uh, people weren't being treated shabbily in terms of the their finances given and taken into consideration that the uh, was basically mostly the low earners uh, that were, were working on this scheme. So I could try to find out from the department whether there's some source which you can go to for that information from, or whether the pensions regulator would hold that information. It's been somewhat difficult to get information from the pensions regulator. I had to go through a freedom of information request. It was just quite difficult to find an inroad and to get to speak to somebody. So um, hopefully, Either the pen, if you the committee can ask the pensions regular well it holds that information, or or if we get a contact, I could try to have a conversation with them to see if we can get that data for you. Yeah, I think that would be an important issue, Eleanor, that we need to find out. You know, it's a bit strange if we're trying to examine the work of this if we can't get the pension regulators to. But especially, it's a it's a protection of the 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 the, the money that's probably uppermost in people's minds. Exactly. Exactly. I don't see any other member hasn't got their hands up online. I'll just double check. It's going to take me a minute to come through. Any other members in the room? Um, Eleanor, I think you're going to escape, but I, I expect we'll probably see yourself okay. next week. Um, yes, you will. Yeah. We're looking forward to that. So we'll be meeting you after the committee next week um, to go through um, that session about research proposals then. But thank you very much for your work on this. It's a very comprehensive paper, um, and it certainly makes understanding the pension world a little bit easier for us. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you very Thank much. Um, okay. Um, so, members, the committee will receive a departmental briefing on the pension scheme bill at the meeting on the 23rd of September. Thank you. Um, so, we have our paper now um, referred to that, and um, hopefully, that will be us asking lovely questions. But thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, I'll move now on to item number seven, which is um, at page 77. I'll draw your attention to SR 2020 forward slash 192, the Private Tenancies Coronavirus Modifications Regulations 2020. Um, I just ask you then. Uh, sorry, sure, just can I just very quickly declare an interest as a uh, private sector landlord, please? Absolutely, Andy. Thank you very much. Um, so, members, you have that rule in front of you. Uh, have any members any objections to this rule? Nobody's indicated. Nobody's coming through on Starleaf. Um, if that's the case with no objections, I'm going to put the following question that the Committee for Communities. Sorry, could I, Chair, I had declared in a previous meeting, but the same as Andy. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to put the question now that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-192, the Private Tenancies Coronavirus Modifications Regulations 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Say an aye or no? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Um, agenda item number eight. I'll take you to page 87, members. Just checking to make sure there's nobody's indicated online. Um, this is the correspondence memo. So I'll just draw your attention. It has been brought up earlier today by Jonathan Buckley that we have um, an invitation to visit Lakada. I hope I'm saying that correctly, Brewery in Port Rush. Um, our members content to note this inv invitation. Uh, we've said earlier today that it's one of the premises that the team may investigate um, for a visit. Um, so, as and when it's safe to do so, um, are we happy to consider or to note this invitation for after the, the review is done? Um, do any Starleaf members want to bring any of the correspondence issues to the attention of the committee? If you want to raise your hand or indicate. I'm not seeing anything coming through. And members in the room, has anybody got anything, any part of the correspondence that you want to draw attention to? If not, then I'll ask all members if you're content to action the correspondence as set out in the correspondence memo. 
Yes, thank you very much. Agenda item nine, it's the forward work programme. Um, so next week, as we've already said, you will be briefed by the Department on the Pension Schemes Bill and on the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. Any members of any comments about that? Happy enough to go forward? Yeah, it might be a long meeting next time, guys, so well, we'll be ready for that one. Um, agenda item number 10, then. Any other business? I'll go first of all to everyone who's... Oh, Paula, sorry. I'll come to you, Paula. Are you coming at us for any other business or the forward work programme? Sorry. No, it's, it's any other business, and it was just something I forgot to mention earlier under Chair's business, if that's OK. Yes. Um, just to remind members, I know whenever I go into committee, I put my telephone onto aeroplane mode, um, which is most definitely what we should be doing if, if the committee's being hand-started in any way. So for members that do that, just to remind you, to turn, switch it off aeroplane mode before you leave the committee room because it actually stops the COVID NI track and trace oh. um, app from working. So it was just a, just a, a, just to mention that for anybody that's on that app and uses aeroplane mode, make sure you do it before you leave the room. Put your put it back uh, aeroplane mode off. That's all. Okay. Good point, Chair. Um, it's important that any of us that have come into contact, get that reported, and, and, and the best way to do it is, of course, through that app. Um, if no one else has any other business... Yes, sorry. I'll go to um, Janice, the clerk. The chair, the minister, is now actually coming on the 30th of September. So it's not start, next week. No, to start her uh, briefings on the list of issues. OK. But given that we're only sending the list of issues today, that may well be of benefit anyway in yes. terms of the information that you get back. Absolutely. I think given the fact that we'll be talking about the Pension Schemes Bill and the Housing Executive next week, that probably makes sense. But as you say, um, if anybody does, just remember that if you have any extra issues to go to, forward to the Minister if you can get them through today, please. Nobody else in the room has any other business? No? Nope. Members, I think that is us for today. Um, thank you very much. The date and time and location of the next meeting is next Wednesday. Paula, isn't that correct? On the 23rd, we're not moving until October, until our Thursday. So it's Wednesday, the 23rd at 2 o'clock in room 29. And with that, the meeting is closed. Thank you very much, folks. <laughs>